Welcome, and thanks for taking a minute to watch this video. My name is Pat, and I'm betting that you and I have a great deal in common. My story began about 22 years ago, when I would watch on Saturday mornings Bob Ross and the Joy of Painting. Bob would begin his presentation by saying, Now if you're going to paint along with me, and I would think, yeah, sure, Bob, I could paint along with you about like I could fly. But the more that I watched, the more I began to think, you know, he makes it look so darned easy. Maybe, just maybe, I could do that. And then I finally reached the point where I said, if I ever have a chance to take a class, that's what I'm going to do. And one day in Arizona, I ran into a lady that was a Bob Ross instructor. I took a class. I found out by golly, I think I can do this, and the rest is history. I'll bet you've felt the same way too. I'll bet if somebody told you that you could paint, you'd say, well, yeah, sure, I can't even do a stick figure. How would I ever be able to paint? Well, you can, and I'm going to show you that you can here today. So I've been a certified Bob Ross instructor for the last 20 plus years, and over that period of time, I have taught thousands of students the techniques that Bob Ross made famous. I've done this in cities all over the West, beginning in a studio in my home. I've taught in colleges, senior centers, uh, art facilities, and even in people's backyards. Some of those students, I can now say, are teaching the Bob Ross technique. I cut my teeth on large groups. That is, I would teach 12 to 14 students at a time. But my legs don't get around the way they used to. And so now I'm teaching only one or two students. Now this is really good for the students that take classes for, from me today because they get uh, individual attention, much more so than when we did a group class. And they get the benefit of paying the same amount today as they would have 20 years ago in a group class. So I'm going to take a few minutes just to show you how easy this technique is and while I prepare for that I'd like for you to watch a little slideshow showing some of the students that I've taught this year. All of these will be students who had never painted before so you'll see their first art presentation. While things are being moved around in the studio I want to say a few words about the slides you're looking at. Each one is a student, or a pair of students, who have never had a class with me, and over 90% of them had never painted at all. And most were among the group who thought they couldn't even draw a stick figure. Well, that might be true, but as I have said previously, this is not a drawing technique. It's a load and touch process, using rather large brushes, so when you're in one of my classes, I stress that you watch exactly how the paint goes on the brush and then how the brush touches the canvas. It really is something that everyone can do. And, as you see, I teach kids of all ages. My youngest ever was five, and over the years there have been many kids in their 90s who have enjoyed the joy of painting. My youth sessions run for an hour or two, depending on the age and maturity of the individual. I really prefer that you don't start your children until they are at least six. Adult classes last about four hours, and I find that if students are 12 or older, they do well in the sessions. In every class, I provide everything. That includes the new canvas, the paints, use of the brushes, and even an apron to wear. At the end of each class, the student goes home with a completed painting. I also teach workshops and if you want to accelerate the learning process, I recommend this avenue. They are five-day sessions where we spend hours in the morning practicing the different ways of loading the brush and applying the brush to the canvas. We then clean the canvas and break for lunch. In the afternoon, we apply those techniques, painting a masterpiece for you to take home. Each day, we build on the learned skills, and by day five, you're ready to paint on your own. Okay, that's enough of my chatter. Let's get to painting. Welcome back. As you can see, we've moved things around just a little bit. 
Uh, I've uh, I've set up a 16 by 20 canvas on my uh, on my easel, and I put a thin even coat of liquid white on it. The colors that I'm going to use today in this painting are titanium white, Prussian blue, a little bit of Van Dyke brown, alizarin crimson, sap green, cad yellow, and a little bit of bright red. Should we get started? Okay, here we go. Okay, so here we go. I'm going to I'm going to begin with just a little bit, a small amount of alizarin crimson on the brush, just a tad. And we're going to start right here in the center of the canvas and put a layer of alizarin crimson in there. And I think I'm going to have some water in this painting, so I'll also take some of that and put it down here below. Now I like the movement in the sky, but for water, water lays flat. So I just put in a nice long flat stroke in there. And then I'm going to go to my Prussian blue. And when I start this, I start in the upper corners because I want them to be darker than the rest. You'll see as I, as the paint leaves the brush and mixes with the liquid white, it gets lighter and lighter and lighter. And that's just exactly what I want. I like the, corner, the corners darker because it forces the eye to the center of the canvas. So we'll just get that on there and then in a minute we'll blend it. First we're going to need to take care of our water down here. Always flat. Now when it comes to taking care of the brush, there's three things that we do. Sometimes we just go from one color to another, and sometimes I will just beat the brush out. I have down here a little beetle bucket, and sometimes I actually clean the brush. So now I'm going to start blending the canvas, at, uh, the paint on the canvas here. And to do that, I work where the two colors come together, and because I have the liquid medium on there, I will blend those until you can't tell where one color stopped and the other one began. I like to have lots of movement in the sky. Sky is not all one color. As a matter of fact, if you go out almost any day and look at the sky, you would never see one sky that's exactly the same every place. Beat the brush out a little bit, and now I'm going to come down here and work those two colors together. There we go. Now then, one of the things, one of the most important things that we do, and what always amazes me, is that you can take a perfectly flat surface and create the illusion of depth and distance. And to that end, I will then start with clouds and then we'll build forward. So I'm going to put some clouds in here. I'm just going to spin this in real quickly. Put in a cloud right here. And then I'm going to take my little one inch brush and I'm going to tap that out. I'll pick the paint up where it is and take it to where it isn't. Just picking it up, being careful not in to get into that top right area up there. Okay, and now if I set another cloud over here, they'd both be the same distance away. But if I layer one in front of this one a little bit, like this maybe, come in here and push it right up there into that cloud, then I very definitely have a cloud that's closer to me. And I'll take my one inch brush again, go back in, pick the paint up where it is, and you'll notice that I'm just tapping. Never do I pull the brush through the canvas. The eye can always see the direction that the brush went across the canvas, and I don't want to see any brush strokes in this part up here. Maybe one more little tiny one real quick. Well, I can find my brush. Right in here. Maybe there's just a little tiny one right there. Take it down in here to that cloud of the red. And one last. Okay, I think next we're going to do mountains. 
And in order to accomplish that, I'm going to uh, take some of my Prussian blue and mix it with the alizarin crimson. And I'll just smash those two colors together. You can't stir this paint because it's so thick. The theory here, of course, is that a thin paint will stick to a thick ur paint. And here, we're going to have a very thick paint. A little bit more crimson until I get kind of a lavender blue color. That should do it. Okay, so now let's create some mountains here. We'll just start in here in the top and just start with maybe we'll have a mountain there and maybe there'll be another one in here someplace. We don't really, really care where they are. And if I cover up a cloud that I really like, well, I know it's back there, so I'm not going to worry about it. There we go. So once we get the color and the shape of our mountains on there, then I'll clean the excess paint off, put it back in the pile. I'm going to take my two inch brush again, and I'm going to go in here and even this paint out. I'm just going to sneak in here with the brush and even that out like that. So now we have our mountain shaped. And I can play with this a little bit. I can kind of look at it and tell whether or not I want that one in front. Or maybe I want to bring this mountain down here in front. So I can just play with it just to get an idea of what I might do next. And next, of course, is clouds. And to do the clouds, I take the titanium white. No blue, please. And I pull it out very flat here like this, cut across, get a thin even roll. And then I'm going to start clear over here on the right and I'm just going to go right in here and touch and start down the mountain a little bit and just let it slide down the mountain like that. And then I'll come in right here with the other side of the blade and pull out some shadow. get a little bit more paint. Maybe there's another little ridge of paint right in here like this. And we'll just work our way across the mountain. No pressure on the knife. The, the, uh, the blade the paint that's on the blade, I'll show you a roll here in just a second, but the, the paint that's on the uh, on the blade just barely touches the canvas, just barely touches, and uh, it will stick to the uh, to the paint that's underneath. The white is a little bit thinner than my dark mountain mix, so you can see it's just a real small roll of paint, and I just touch and just barely let it touch, slide across the, the uh, canvas like that. Now if I wanted I could make a shadow color, but now I'm just letting it blend with the uh, with the mountain base that I put on there. Almost there. Pretty good sized range of mountains for just a couple of minutes. A little paint, go across, open it up as we go across. Just reach in, I just grab the very edge of that. I don't want to take all that white paint off. Sometimes I find that students will get up way up into the mountain and take all their paint away and then we have to we have to redo it. And redoing it isn't a problem really. We can uh, we don't make any mistakes in this technique. We have happy accidents of course, but uh, we can uh, we can virtually change anything that we've done apart from getting too dark too quick. And uh, you'll notice as I, as I paint, I try to get as little bit of paint as I can to start with on the, on the brush. And then if I need to intensify the color, I can go back and make it stronger. But if I get it too dark in any place, 
there's no taking the dark off. Just isn't done. Okay, so now I have my mountains in. I'm going to take two inch, or the two, yeah, the two inch brush, and I'm just going to soften these at the base a little bit. I'm just going to tap a little bit, just to create kind of a misty look down in here, following the uh, the lay of the land, and then I'll very carefully pull up just the tiniest little bit, two hairs and some air. Okay, so now. Let's make a darker color for some trees and things. So again, I'm taking the dark color that I had mixed up. I'm going to add some sap green to that. It's going to look black on the palette, but it's going to be very dark on the canvas. And of course, the trees I'm going to put in now are a long ways away. We try to create the illusion of depth and distance Realizing that the farther things are away, the smaller they are in size and the less color that you would perceive on them. So that's another way, in addition to the layering, that we create that illusion of depth and distance. So, I'm now going to load the brush. I'm just going to use this little one inch brush. And I'm going to load a lot of paint into the bristles so that I can get it to a nice chiseled edge. And once I have a lot of paint in the bristles, then I'll tap back in, push it in until I get a little roll forming right in front of the brush. That same roll of paint is right on the brush itself. And I'm just going to tap in some foothills back in here. And I have a lot of paint. There's a lot of texture on the canvas there. Unlike what you would see with traditional oils and traditional painting, because here, we're going to layer it all, make it all in one time. So what, what traditional artists might spend a week or two or three doing, you and I are going to do here in just a few minutes. Okay, now then we're going to take the brush and pull up just a little bit at the top here and create the uh, some tree trunks up in here, just little tiny ones. People will think you spent weeks and weeks and weeks with a little tiny brush painting these on. Not so. There you go. We got those men there like that. So again, they're very far away. They have very little color value. And uh, we're done with that part. This is going to be some uh, a lake, I think. So we're going to use the two inch brush, create a water line here. So to make the water line reflection, I just reach in and grab the bottom of the color of the paint and I pull straight, straight down. Straight down. Beat the brush out, and then I'm going to pull right straight across and mirror that. Just blur that a little bit so it looks like a reflection on the water. Now that we have the reflections pulled down into the water, I'm going to take some of the liquid white. This is very, very thin, and I'm going to take my large knife and cut across just a little bit like that to get a very thin roll of paint on the knife. Just very, very thin. And then the knife is going to come up here at an angle. I'm going to go in, and it's almost as if I'm trying to cut through the canvas. I just come across, sawing across, my way across, creating that water line. Go back in, pick up a little bit more paint, come back to this other side, go back the other way. Maybe a little bit more right in there. There we go. Now then, back to the one inch brush, which I have not cleaned. And again, I'm loading it just as I did before. This is called a tappy grass load. But I'm just going to tap back in so you can see that roll of paint right on the front of it. And I think maybe what we'll do is right in here, put a little sort of a peninsula out here. Perhaps something like that. And here, the trees would be a little bit taller, so if you can see this, I'm just going to pull up with the brush. Make them a little taller and put my reflection in again. Pulling down. And then I'm going to 
of frost with the corner of the brush. Back in with my knife to make the water line. Now I want to make something really, really clear. Many people, when they do this technique, try to draw. They try to think, well, I have to be able to draw to do it. As you can see, I use pretty large tools, and there's no drawing involved. It's, uh, it's strictly how you load the brush and how that brush touches the canvas. And that's what I teach. The, uh, the rest of it is just you making it the way you want it. And it's truly your world. Like I say, we never make mistakes. If I was teaching a class of 20 students and I had my sample that we were painting from and I painted a painting, at the end of the class we would have 22 different paintings. And that's just the way it is. And that's great. But the thing of it is, is all 22 of them would be good enough to go up on your wall. And that's the important thing. So now I'm just putting in a, a base of, of uh, land here in front, something that's closer. I'm going to be just a little bit. And I think we'll put some grass down there. So to that end, I'm going to take the uh, that dirty brush and go into some sap green and then into my cad yellow and I'm going to make a, a grass colored yellow here. Tap back in with my taffy grass load and then I'm just going to come in here and tap working my way down. So I get my highlight on the top and then as I mix it with the uh, with the dark color underneath it gets darker and darker and darker and then I come back into where I have the dark color and I put another layer of grass in there. And maybe this one comes over here like this. If I get it too, uh, too hilly out here I might not want to mow it so I've got to be a little bit careful about how I go in here. But you can shape it any any way that you want. You notice I'm not cleaning the brush at all. I'm just beating the excess paint out. And the reason that I do that is I don't want to contaminate with the dark color the uh, the yellow that I have on my palette. Just about there. Typically, when I'm when I'm teaching a class, we use one of two sizes: uh, a 12 by 16, which is smaller than this, and a 16 by 20. And it really doesn't matter which we use. I have both, and it's just a matter of how much wall space you want to occupy with your painting when you get home. Okay, now that we have some grass in there, maybe we should. Uh, Maybe we should make one of those happy little trees that Bob Ross is, is so famous for. And to do that we take a fan brush, we load it to a nice chiseled edge, and then I'm just going to go in here and touch in the top of a tree, come over here and lightly touch, and then just tap. Again, it's a tap stroke. And I'm guessing that he would need a friend. So maybe right in here we'd have a little friend for him just a little bit. Center out, center out. That's all I'm doing. A little overlapping touch strokes. And when I do it, the corner of the brush comes up each time that I touch. That makes the brows go down. If I had it so the brush, the br bristles were down, then the uh, then the brows would uh, would come up. And maybe maybe there's one more right in here. And we'll just push that uh, that little peninsula back, so that helps to give us the, uh, the perspective that we were looking for. Okay, clean that out a little bit, and maybe we'll take some of that brown that we had, come down here and mix it with the white, just to get us a a uh, little bit of color we can use for a tree trunk. And we'll come in here with the knife and we'll just touch in a little bit of tree trunk here and there 
we wouldn't see tree trunk all the way up and down the uh, the tree because the boughs would be in the way. Okay. I'll use this small brush. And then I'm going to go back with a fan brush and we'll put just a little bit of highlight on these. We're getting down here where we're just about, just about done. I have paint left and we have a couple of minutes more so I'm going to take the bush, the, the one inch brush and do a bush load. Just come in here like this. Pull and pull and pull and pull until I get that stippling and I tap down. And then I'm just going to come in here and touch and just push up. And the, uh, the bristles as they're going up, they make the uh, indication of those little twigs there. So, and then we can come back in with, uh, this is a, uh, an oval brush. You can see it's shaped, nice shape on it so that we can get some bush shapes in here. And I'm just going to go in and just very lightly touch in some color to, uh, to that. And now it's all ready, except for the signature. Uh, typically, uh, a painting like this in an adult class would take us about four hours to do. I also do youth classes. They, uh, uh, they last depending upon the age of the student, and I teach as young as six, between an hour and two hours. So thank you very much. I appreciate your painting along with me. I, uh, I hope as we end this up that, uh, that you'll take note of the phone number. And, uh, and my website and uh, get in touch with me. Thank you so much.